The Fed 15 podcast is presented by Serving Those Who Serve, a fiduciary fee-based financial planning firm serving federal government employees and retirees all over the country. This podcast is for informational purposes only and is not intended to be taken as financial advice. All listeners should consult their personal advisors before taking any action. The opinions expressed by our host are their own and do not reflect the views, policies, or position of Raymond James. Securities are offered through Raymond James Financial Services, Inc., member FINRA, SIPC. Investment advisory services are offered through Raymond James Financial Services Advisors, Inc. Serving those who serve is not a registered broker-dealer and is independent of Raymond James Financial Services, Inc. And now, here are your hosts. Dan Sipe serves as a branch manager for Raymond James Financial Services and Serving Those Who Serve, and Caitlin Murray is a financial advisor through Raymond James Financial Services and Director of Advisory Services here at Serving Those Who Serve. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of the Fed 15 podcast presented by Serving Those Who Serve. Each week, you know we discuss the latest news and info that feds need to know in 15 minutes or less. So whether you are a seasoned federal employee or whether you're just starting out in your career, Fed 15 has got you covered. So grab your coffee, kick back, and we'll tell you what you need to know but might have missed this week. We are your hosts, Caitlin Murray, and I am joined by the lovely Dan Sype today. My, How are you doing, uh, Caitlin? perennial co-host. Is that the right usage of the word perennial? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Dan's a word man. Indeed, that that works. I'm inevitable like Thanos. I just keep showing up. Yeah. He just keeps showing up to work. He just keeps signing into a Zoom square, folks. (laughs) There you go. There you go. No, we love Dan. We love Dan. Awesome. All right. Well, so we have a correction to issue, I think you mentioned. We (laughs) we have our, our first correction. You know, I I said in the last episode that I thought the Olympic trials would be in April. They're actually the last week of June for track and field. So it's just about one month before Paris. And again, I've said this before, we're a Throws family. We got started because of getting to know uh, Olympic gold medalist Stephanie Brown Trafton, a discus medalist from Beijing. And, you know, we we are, you know, we we won't know until the trials are done. But we've got three defending world champions going to this thing. So, you know, just ooh, I'm very excited. So uh, just letting you know, folks, there will be track geekery uh, <laughs> taking taking place through uh, through the summer. And Caitlin, you're in the final stages for your show, right? We are. We are in the final throws. In fact, uh, and a podcaster supposed to be timeless, but this one is a little time more timely, I think, than most. But by the time this episode airs, we will have actually just closed the show. Okay. On March 11th. And, and so. what's the name? What's the name? Uh, it's Picasso at Lupina Gilles. For those who are new and maybe haven't um, heard, I, I do a lot of work with my local theater um, scene, and I am directing uh, that it's an absurdist comedy by Steve Martin. And it has been definitely a a journey. It's been a really interesting production to work on an absurdist sort of show, but lots of fun, really great cast and crew. It's at Smokestack Theater Company in Danville, Virginia. And yeah, yeah, I I can't say come see it on this episode because we will have just closed it, but (laughs) uh, positive, positive vibes for for a great run for everybody. Um, All intents and purposes in tech right now, it looks like we should be great. So yes. um, So yeah. Present and future tense and what will be past tense. Break a leg, have broken a leg. You know, just make sure that legs are broken. Yeah. Uh, in the process. For sure. And for so those sure. of you who are not theater people, I did not just advocate workplace violence. <laughs> okay. No, it's, I just said a good thing. In the mafia and in theater, legs are yes. broken. Yep. Awesome. All right. Well, we've got so some what, interesting. what are we talking about today? I, th- I think we got some cool stuff. Yeah, we've got some interesting topics coming up today. Dan is going to take us inside the TSP, which is very interesting. Always a always an interesting topic for our feds, kind of a, a, a topic of great interest, I guess I should say. And then we are also going to talk about FERS. We're going to talk about who funds FERS specifically. And there's there's a little bit of nuance there that I think is helpful. But Dan, do you want to take us inside oh, the TSP absolutely. first? Absolutely. Yep. 
A big shout out to Jen Meyer from our team, wrote just a phenomenal article that really clarifies some things that a lot of people don't know about the S fund and the I fund. See, here's the thing that I'm really proud of here at Serving This to Serve, folks. We're going to teach you what you need to know. If you want to do it yourself, okay, yes, do we have a full service fiduciary financial planning group? 100%. But we're going to give you the info that will help you do things yourself if you want to. If you want help, we're here. Always happy to have that conversation. So <clears throat> digging into the S fund and the I fund, they really are misunderstood and they need to be explained better. So Jen's title, which is awesome, is sort of small cap and incomplete international. Mm, so yeah. we like to say when people see S for S fund, they say that must be small cap. We like to say it stands for sort of because its underlying index is not the Russell 2000, for example, which is a true small cap index. It's actually the Dow Jones U.S. Completion Total Stock Market Index. Wow, lots of words. So what does that mean? Remember, C fund is the S&P 500. So that's the first 500 companies size-wise in the United States that are publicly traded. This starts at 501. And then it goes down approximately another 4,500 companies. So yes, there's a whole lot of small companies in that mix. But Caitlin, there's also some pretty big ones because 501 is the next one to go in. Right. If, if somebody stumbles out, that's a darn big company. Why does that matter, you say, Dan? Thank you for asking, Caitlin. I, I, I will be happy to tell you. <laughs> so if you're following asset allocation, which we believe is important, Mm -hmm. And you're saying, I want 20% based on my ability to tolerate risk in U.S. small. And you say, I will put 20% in the S fund. You're not going to end up with 20% in small because of that chunk that is so big in there. So as much as 25% of the, the makeup of the S fund could technically be considered U.S. large. So if you want... 20% in small, you need to gross that up a little bit. Maybe yeah. get up towards 25%. This is not saying good or bad, folks. Please, please, please understand that. Okay? This is how it's set up. So this is how you can use it to get the best for yourself. Okay? So that's the S fund. The I fund, God love it. Okay? Or from the South, bless its heart. <laughs> you know, it's since 2001, which was a little bit late to get an international fund, in my opinion, but yeah, it's been set up on the MSCI EFA index, Morgan Stanley Capital Investment EFA, and it stands for Europe, Australasia, and Far East. So essentially, Europe, uh, Japan, New Zealand, a few other small places in there. Well, that was an awesome index in 1986. Okay. The world has gotten bigger. I know it's the same size as it was originally created, but it's gotten bigger and markets have opened up everywhere. It really is a global economy. So the Retirement Thrift Investment Board diligently worked to identify what the new index should be. And in 2017, they announced that it would move to the MSCI World minus the U.S. index. So take the whole world, just pull us out. A true international index. Yay! And the countdown would be that it would go in place in 2019. They'll never tell you the exact day because selling out of an index, if you tell somebody that you're the biggest right. retirement plan in the world, you're going to sell out of that index, the vultures are going to come and take positions opposite you. Right. So you never tell them the exact day. That's fine. Say that 2019 will make the change. That's great, right, Caitlin? That's good news. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. did that happen? No. Unfortunately, no. No. <laughs> okay. Because you'll notice I'm in gray, Caitlin, because we're, we're, we got progress on no shutdown. So I'm not going to say anything bad about the Congress right now because they're doing what they should do, which is pass a budget. But sometimes they get distracted and go into other things. And this is one of those examples. So let's just say well-meaning people on the Hill who might not be as well-informed as they could be put forth a bill to block it. And thankfully, the bill went nowhere. And there are always crazy bills that come up in Congress relating to the TSB that go nowhere. But this time was a little different because when the bill went nowhere, well, many members of Congress petitioned the former White House to replace the 
the members of the Retirement Investment Board to prevent this change from going through. And that did happen. New administration, new board, got back to work. We have a new index, Caitlin. We absolutely do. And it is the MSCI world minus the U.S., minus China, minus Hong Kong. I can think of no economic reason for doing it that way. So that's all I'm going to say. So I want to stress this. Number one, still an improvement. You're picking up a ton of emerging and frontier markets in there. Yes, yes, very good, happy. But I can't come up with any reason other than well-meaning members of Congress who maybe not were, were not as informed as they should be kicked up a ruckus and the board responded. So I'm not, I'll do another podcast on that. So yeah. it's still a slightly incomplete iPhone. It's still sort of small cap, slightly incomplete. I doesn't mean bad. You just need to know it. So if you're going to use this and you choose that you think it's your best interest to not in- exclude investment in the second largest economy in the world, you need to supplement that somewhere, whether it's yep. through the mutual fund window or your outside holdings. Again, yep. we're teaching you how to do it yourself. And if you ever decide, this is too much, there's too many weird things going on, will you help us? Yes, we're happy to have that conversation. So doesn't mean bad, but now you know what you need to know. So there you go. That's sort of small cap and incomplete iFund. So, Caitlin, tell us about funding first. Yeah, I love that title, sort of small cap and incomplete iFund. It's definitely, it's very much true. And I think your takeaway there, Dan, is really important. I just want to highlight that, you know, knowing that you are underexposed to certain sectors of the economy gives you the foresight and the ability to kind of overweight that elsewhere in your portfolio. This would be your outside accounts, you know, those sorts of things. So I think having that information is really powerful because it allows you to then follow up and correct for that somewhat political underexposure there. All right. So looking at FERS, kind of changing gears, you know, this is, we often talk about the three-legged stool of retirement being your FERS pension for most folks, unless you're under CSRS, your social security and your investment accounts, which would include the TSP. So we've already talked about kind of one leg of that stool with TSP, now looking into another leg with FERS. So FERS, as you probably know, as a government employee, it's funded by the employee, the agency, and also the government at large. So FERS was set up to kind of avoid unfunded liabilities, which is a very polished way of saying too much going out, not enough coming in. That was the issue with CSRS. We had more going out to retirees than what was going into the plan, which presents, obviously, if this is a federal government retirement plan, that presents a strain on taxpayers, right? So when FERS was introduced in 87, we were looking to kind of rework that system and find a way to, you know, make that solvent, basically. So with FERS, your total government contributions are 23% of your average salary. So about 16 and a half of that 23% comes directly from your agency. And this was slightly decreased from 16.6% um, starting in October 2023. But of course, you're still getting the overall 23% contribution from Uncle Sam. Now, I will make a caveat here. It's an important one, particularly if you are special provisions. The 23% and 16.5% from agency contribution is for regular feds, not for our special provisions folks. Special provisions, your agency contribution depends on your type of occupation. So for example, Leo's different than air traffic control. You can find the benefits administration letter from OPM that outlines the full list of agency contributions for special provision employees, depending on you know job category, occupation category, that is linked in our funding FERS who contributes what article on the STWS blog. So we did link that there for you. But if we were to list out all of the list of agency contributions for different special provisions folks, they're very varied. It would probably take 
three podcasts. More than episodes, 15 minutes. So. <laughs> yeah, for sure. That would go way over the 15 ish that we hold ourselves to. But for our regular federal government employees, it's 23% total government contribution. 16 and a half of that 23% comes directly from your agency. And then, of course, we have the employee contributions. So FERS employees who were hired in 2012 or earlier, about 0.8% of each paycheck goes directly into FERS for you. And we also have FERS Ray, the revised annuity employees. Those were folks hired in 2013. For those folks, 3.1% goes to FERS from your paychecks. There's also FERS Fray, further revised annuity employees, as you know. These are folks who are hired in 2014 and later, right? So for these folks, about 4.4% goes into FERS from pay. So you are contributing 4.4%. The government as a whole is contributing 23% there. I know that sometimes we can get a little salty about, you know, the 4.4% that's going into the FERS plan. But if you look at the, yeah, if you look at the big picture, you know, it's, it's pretty significant, you know, difference in those contributions. So just wanted to kind of break that down so that you can be aware of how FERS gets funded, how this magical check that starts arriving when you retire and file your paperwork correctly. How does that get to you? Great stuff. That's great insight, Caitlin. And I think that's all the time we have today, folks. But we will be back next week, as we always do, to bring you the latest updates you need to make uh, informed decisions about your career and financial well-being as Fed. Want to say a fond farewell. Okay, because I understood this week, NITP had its last podcast of four-year benefit. So big salute to Bob Lines and the crew over there. Folks, if you're a regular listener to that and you're looking for a place to go, love yeah. to have you here. Bob and I actually went to the same high school. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, best of luck, Bob. You've been a, a real resource for feds, and we're happy to keep that mantle going forward if folks want to follow us here. So Absolutely. Quick aside Absolutely. there, Caitlin. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, no, that's great. If you are interested in following us and, you know, being up to date on all of the latest news, we release episodes of Fed 15 weekly. We release episodes of Fed Life, our other podcast, twice a month. So basically bi monthly. Be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Fed Life. You can also find both Fed 15 and the Fed Life podcast on Spotify if you're a Spotify person so that you never miss an episode. And please, please do remember to share it with your friends and colleagues. You can just grab the YouTube link, send it to somebody in an email, you know, and they a door opens up to all of this federal benefits education for them, which is really powerful. Absolutely. And for more information on the topics covered in today's show and more, check out the blog, blog that com. Subscribe to the newsletter, the weekly serving. Then we're going to ship the latest to you every single week. You won't have to go looking. The lovely Caitlin will show up every single week. I'll be tagging along too, so you'll be stuck with me. But I will get that right to you. Absolutely. And for those who want to dive even deeper into learning about your federal benefits and financial planning for feds, maybe you've got some questions on the TSP stuff that we talked about. Maybe you know, you're realizing that between FERS and Social Security, is there enough there? Is there not enough there? Um, for those sorts of questions, we definitely encourage you to join us for one of our complimentary webinars. We have coming up on March 14th, a Social Security for Feds webinar from 1 p.m. to 4 p.m. And then we have a TSP planning webinar coming up on March 20th from 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can register on our website, which is sgwserve.com. But I highly encourage you. Both of those are really great sessions. You can learn a lot there. We have our kind of guru, Ed Zerndorfer, hosting. Um, but if you're not available for those webinars, or if you just prefer a one-on-one -on -one approach, a little bit more comprehensive, kind of digging into the financial planning aspect of things, please feel free to reach out to our team directly for a financial planning consultation. It is complimentary and it really is no obligation. We're just here to help if we can. That email address to do that is askstws at stwserve.com. Indeed. So thanks for listening to the Fed 15. I'm Dan Seif and she is the amazing Caitlin Murray. And we will see you next week. See you next week, guys. Take care. <laughs>